my name's Kat Reggie, aka Baddy Bidoo, and today we're having a look at an introduction to watercolour, which hopefully will be useful to those of you who are just getting started, as well as those of you who have been going for a little while but might have forgotten uh, what the key points are, um, with the very top of that list being to try to enjoy it as you go along. Um, so everything that we do is based on um, enjoyment, anti-perfection and enjoying the process rather than the outcome. Uh, I've got live weekly sessions as well as pre-recorded tutorials um, where we all just play and learn to use our materials and enjoy the experience as much as worrying about what comes out at the end. First things first, let's have a look at brushes um, and other writing implements that we might want to use whilst we're going. Um, a range of brushes is always helpful because it will help you create a range of different shapes. Uh, I use synthetic brushes because they are just as good as natural hair brushes uh, these days. They hold lots of water, they're very soft, um, and they are kind of to animals. They are also cheaper, which is a great perk. I love the ones with this shaped end because they create really useful um, petal and leaf shapes for me. So I have got um, a blog post with links to all of these things, which I will link alongside posts wherever I can, but also if you head to the website and type in recommended materials, you'll find the blog post there too. So a range of different shaped brushes. I started out just stealing my kids' brushes and that worked absolutely fine to get me into it. Um, these ones are a mixture of not hugely expensive brands and they all work well. So just have a little play, start out with one brush. I always say this one's a great one to get started with uh, for following the tutorials because it's one that I use a lot. It's got a lovely pointed tip so you can get really fine points onto things when you want to. All of these, the similarity that they have is that you can get a nice fine point at the end so that when you want to do detailed things, you can. And when you want to do big, looser things, you can do that as well. Um, next is, it's quite useful to have a watercolor crayon. Uh, you could use a pencil, a pen, you could use a normal pencil crayon. Um, I use a watercolour pencil just because it sort of dissolves into the paint a little bit as you go, but you still definitely see your workings, which doesn't bother me at all, because I work on a very um, loose, uh, messy kind of basis where I'm happy for people to see my working because I think that people try and hide uh, the effort that they've put into things too much. Um, I think it's OK to show that you've put effort into making something nice. And then something that I use a lot, um, and it's just a matter of taste as to what you want to do, is a waterproof fine liner. I use black ink. I've tried different coloured inks. I've tried sepia ink and brown and colours. And I just keep coming back to the black, but that's just down to trial and error and see what you like. So I go for microns a lot of the time, although I've just started using Tom's Studio uh, pen because I can refill it. But when you start out, a uh, Sharpie waterproof fine liner is an excellent um, low cost um, stepping stone into the fine liners because it's only about one or two quid. It's, it's really cheap and you can get it pretty much anywhere. Again, I think it's linked in the blog post um, as are microns, I believe. This is a 04. I love to go really, really thin um, on the ends. So I often go down to sort of 001s and things like that, but just see what you like. So that is the writing and painting implements. Now, in terms of papers, I think that everyone should start out fairly low cost um, while they figure out if they like it. And I find that oh, this watercolour block is great because it is 50 sheets of um, cold pressed, which just means it's nice and textured uh, watercolour specific paper. You get 50 whole sheets. It's not super expensive. There's cheaper out there. Uh, it will warp. The cheaper you go, the, the more it will warp as you paint. But that's a great starting point. And that's from Cass Art, uh, cassart.co.uk. You can find all sorts of different papers and sizes on um, on anywhere that you go to shop. And if you find A3 a bit daunting, just buy it and cut it down the middle or into four pieces. I think I started out with an A5 pad, which is great because you can just do lots of little things. Um, Yes, so start out with a nice cheap paper. Recognise that it might make your own life a little bit harder because it will warp and things a bit. It's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's the paper. Um, and then you can move up and try all sorts of um, other papers once you realise that you love it. There is no rush. Um, yes, so go with whatever paper you've got in the house and then make it watercolour specific whenever you can just to give yourself a slightly easier time. Also, I intended to say that with paper, the textured paper is the cold pressed or not. It's often written in brackets um, and that will give you the nice texture, which is sort of, I don't know if you can really see it on the video, but it's that, it's that textured um, 
classic textured watercolour paper. If you want a really smooth paper so that you can do really tiny fine details, then go for hot pressed because that will give you an incredibly smooth uh, finish. Um, yes, that's it for paper for now. Next, paint. I have a big light plastic palette. Some people are really sniffy about it being ceramic. Um, you will give them giving all different reasons for that. Um, I see no difference at all apart from price, which is a huge difference, and also weight. I have um, uh, hands which are very shaky and sometimes get a bit sore. So plastic is great for me because it's light. I could hold it for ages um, without it becoming an issue. And it's cheap. You could get a nice big palette. I would suggest finding something with nice big spaces in so that you can mix lots of colours in each space. And if you have blocks of watercolour, then you can either pop them out and into a tray like this so that you get a bit more swishy space to get enough water in with the paint. Um, or you can use the lid that comes with it to really mix up the colour with uh, a bit of water. So that's what you call activating the paint is when you get a little bit of water on your brush and put it onto your paint, whatever the uh, whatever type of paint it is that you have, um, whether that be block or tube and you activate it with water. And then you can see you can just pull it out into the water and that's called activating it. Um, so if your paint is quite hard to activate, then you will need to just um, put a bit of water on each colour or spray it with one of those squishy psh, psh, type water guns and um, give it a couple of minutes before you start painting. And then when you, as soon as you touch the paint, then you'll get lots and lots of colour out of it. All the pigment will really small quickly. Um, I'm not going to lie, I love a bit of Daniel Smith tube colour. It lets out loads of colour really quickly. You really don't have to work it at all. And um, they're really vibrant. And um, at the beginning, though, there's so many different things you can get started with while you decide uh, where you are going with the hobby and um, and to decide which colours you like and which paints you like and whether you like them in a block or a tube. But this is the sort of palette I recommend because it's great to be able to get enough water in there that you can get a nice watery mix. Remember, watercolour paint likes water. OK, if you keep it really thick, whether that's tube or from a block or from a palette like this, um, if you keep it really thick, you won't be able to see the paper glowing through. And that's what gives watercolour its real vibrancy. So whether you use tube or block or tube onto something like this and then let it dry out. Uh, make sure that you're using lots of water. Okay, lots and lots of water, that is the goal. Talking of water, I use these days a great big box of water because it means that I have to replace it less frequently. So jars are lovely and pretty, uh, cutie little jars, but um, a big box of water means that you're not gonna be going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards to the sink. Um, and it will mean that you can get a really good swish and get all that paint off. And uh, yes, so I recommend lots of water. Now, the last thing that I have all the time, pretty much for these sessions, is something to wipe my brush on and pick up extra, um, extra water when I've spilt it everywhere, which happens all the time because I use lots of water. Um, you can either use kitchen towel, which is great because you can scrump it up and throw it away. Or if you don't want to be scrumpling things up and throwing them away quite so often, then cloths are brilliant. Just a cheap cloth that's nice and absorbent so that when you have a wet brush, you can give it a squeeze and then you'll be able to pick up paint with it. Um, or you can just give a little wipe down to anything you spill or a little dab to anything on your page that you want to pick up. And either of these options works great. So next I'm going to show you a few things on a piece of paper which will hopefully help you decode some of the watercolour language what people are actually talking about when they do these tutorials okay let's go first thing we're going to have a look at is some phrases that often throw people when they're starting out so the first one is wet on wet so that means that the paint is wet and it's going onto a wet surface so that can either mean that it's a wet watery surface or a wet painty surface OK, so we've got a wet painty surface and a wet watery surface. Now, anything that goes wet onto wet will have fuzzy edges, fluffy edges where the water, where the paint spreads out. OK, so it means that you're not really in control of it because it goes fluffing, fluffing off everywhere, which is great. Um, it looks really nice. Um, but if you want a crisp edge to something or if you're trying to paint something small and detailed, it's not very useful. Um, wet paint into wet paint 
is the same. You will end up with a mixture of those two colors and you will be able to create some lovely effects, but you will not end up with crisp edges. Wet on dry is when you put something wet onto something dry and I am going to show you that that can either be on the page or it can be onto paint. So wet on dry, my page is dry and I'm putting wet paint onto it, which means that the edges have crisp lines. And now I'm going to put this here and we'll have a look in a minute at what it looks like to put wet paint onto dry paint. Blending is can be lots of things. It can be blending the edges of something out so that they're blurry. It can be blending colours into each other. Uh, so if we have got this colour here and I want to blend it out into, let's just say onto plain paper, then I could wet the edge of it and keep blending out. Wet my brush and let it kind of run out like that. I tend to do these things in a fairly relaxed way. So if I think that the paint is running too far that way, then I can tip my page. And that will tip some of the pigment back that way, but it will have a knock on effect as the water re enters the slightly more dry paint. Um, it will create blooms and sort of cauliflower shapes over here. The other blending is if you have another colour, that you can blend them into each other in the middle. And there's you kind of get very complex with blending the two into each other. Um, or you can keep it fairly relaxed. You can probably start to guess how I feel about it, which is that I tend to keep it quite relaxed. Because the nice thing about using wet paint is that they will uh, do interesting things with each other. They will start creating all their own uh, shapes and colours in the middle. So that is blending, which I don't do an awful lot of um, because I like the shapes that watercolours create by themselves. Now, lifting is... If you have got some paint and let's say you've made some nice wet paint and you want to take some of that paint off while it's wet is easier. So you can use your piece of kitchen towel or your cloth, dry your brush so that it's wet, but not it's, it's not completely dry, but it's, it's definitely not loaded with paint. And you can suck the paint back off the paper like that. You will find different papers will let you do that to different extents. And that sometimes relates to whether it's a, an expensive paper or not, but not always, because this is not expensive paper and you've just seen that that does it pretty well. Uh, as it gets drier, it is harder to do that. So these edges over here will be starting to get dry and you can see that there's an edge there. I've been able to lift some of the paint off, but uh, if I re-wet it and kind of work it a little bit with the brush, and then do it again, then because I've re-wet it, I can pick a bit more up with my, with my brush like that. And papers that are thicker, watercolour papers, if they're stronger, so they've got cellulose or they've got cotton as part of them, they will find it easier to let you lift paint back off without rolling up. This one, because it's a cheap paper, if I keep working that same area and re-wetting it and lifting and scrubbing and um, going back in with more water, the paper will start to uh, degrade and kind of um, bobble up a little bit, but it's coped with that amount of uh, playing. And it's quite useful to be able to lift if, for example, you have like a little water spillage and something that you thought was in the right place, suddenly you've got this, you can dry your brush and kind of suck it back off the page, which is really useful. If something is totally dry and you try and lift it off, you will find it much more difficult. We'll come back and have a look at that once that's dry. Now, a leaf shape is something that we use all the time um, in the tutorials and in the live sessions because we do lots and lots of botanically um, uh, animals and plants type things. So I'm going to tell you how to do it just because it will be a nice way of getting you started. So you put paint onto your brush, give it a little load up in the paint. So that there's enough that it is definitely, you can see there's quite a lot on there, but it's not dripping. So if I go like this, it's not falling off. It's just nicely loaded. Um, I, all the brushes that I use have this point at the end, like I was telling you before, which makes it a little bit easier to put the top point to the paper, press, and then lift and kind of twist a little bit and it'll help you get a point on it. The more you do this and the better your brush is, the more you will get this shape every time. I don't get it every time. And if I'm in a rush uh, or my brush is a bit dirty, then 
the end sort of splits. Um, you can do it with the flat of the brush or because this one is wider than it is uh, sort of deep, you can create long, thin type shapes as well. And all your different brushes will give you different shapes. So another way of creating shapes is kind of by using the brush as a stamp instead of using it to brush stroke across the page. You can stamp, 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 create some quite sweet little sort of geometric shapes. And uh, again, all your different brushes will create different shapes for these. So if I grab another one, then you'll see that we will get a different shape out of it. So with this brush, it's a little bit smaller, it's not as wide. And we can get the same way you use the point, use point, press, lift and twist. If it's not pigmented enough, you can always drop some more in there. You can even nap edges, do anything you like. Now, when it comes to stems for leaves, you can obviously just use the tip of your paintbrush and you can just draw it in. I've got very wobbly hands. So one of those paints that you saw me, you one of those brushes that you saw me um, showing you earlier on is called a rigger brush, uh, which I use a lot. Um, this is a fairly small one, but it's got thin, long bristles, which means that when I'm using it, uh, the long bristles act a bit like suspension. So that if I'm shaking, the bristles will still kind of keep a fairly straight uh, line. I've got a really long rigger, which gives me an excellent long stem if I'm doing a big painting. Let me show you this one. It's got a lovely long stem um, out of that one. So you can see that riggers are long and thin. So this one's bristles start all the way back here. That's great for lovely long stems too. And give you nice thin lines. Sometimes they'll still shake though, because it's not a magical brush and I have got very shaky hands. So there's lots of different ways that these work. But that's a very useful brush to have if you like fine stems as a rigger brush, because it's called a rigger brush because it was used often to create the rigging on boats when you painted them. So back to my other brush, undoing mistakes. I find this to be something that is very useful. We've just talked a little bit about if things go wrong up there. Now let's say, Let's choose a nice bright colour here. Let's make some big bright mistakes. <laughs> so if I'm painting something orange, let's say I've got, so we use that sort of leaf shape to create a flower there. And then I'm going to create a nice dark middle for it. And whilst creating this dark middle, like that, I accidentally touch it to a petal. And because it's wet, it bursts into it so that's wet into wet which means that you've got no control over the edges of it and it will all go very fluffy now if I was doing this in one of my paintings I would just leave it because I really like it when paint runs into paint um, and my way of fixing that would be doing absolutely nothing and letting it letting it just run so I paint all sorts of flowers next to each other and they all run into each other and that is part of what we do is in terms of anti-perfection is that we let everything just run into itself, run into each other, and we have a good old draw over it at the end and enjoy ourselves with the, the colourful mess that results out of it. Um, and that is, oh, that brush wasn't clean. There we go. Look, so another way you can fix things is by lifting the things out with the bristle. Now, earlier on, you might have noticed that I put some paint on the paper here, and that's, you know, it's not hugely beautiful. So one thing that you can fix mistakes, you can give it a little gentle scrub. It's not the best paper ever. It is quite absorbent. Uh, so I probably won't be able to get it all out. If this was a more expensive paper or had better sizing on it, which is the layer that keeps it um, almost sealed, uh, which a paper like Bockingford is really good if you want to be able to lift things really easily. Um, but you can see I'm just giving it, just gently working it with the brush and the water. It's not coming out even when I dab it quite hard with the towel. That's probably not coming out. If it's teeny dots like these, you can sometimes use a little razor blade to take it off if you're very, very careful. Um, and if you are a child, do not do that. Um, if you were determined to try and fix this that we've let go for a nice long time now, so it's really 
making its way out into the battle there. You can squeeze your brush in the kitchen towel, get it nice and dry again, and you can lift that out because it's still wet. You've got a pretty good chance of doing that. And wash brush, go back in again. Just make sure you take it right back to away from where you're about to put re-put the petal shape in. Because otherwise the same thing will happen again if you go back in with it. And then there you go. Once that's dried, you would barely notice. But like I say, I let things run into each other left, right and centre. I just find it's better to lean into it, go with it, and it makes the whole thing more fun. Um, another way that I fix and mistakes is definitely in inverted commas here because um, I really quite enjoy the mess. But so if you load up, load up your brush and let's do some blobs. OK, so you have accidentally spilt splashy yellow all over your uh, all over your page. And I would usually let this dry and do it at the end, but I'll show you how I would fix this mistake. And that is that I get my pen and I draw a flower around them. Like I said, I lean into the mess. I've given it a, a wide berth on that one because I don't want to uh, draw the yellow all over the page, but uh, I really enjoy leaning into the anti-perfection. Okay, so even if I didn't want it over here, you could try and lift it off. That would work well. You could paint another leaf over it and disguise it, or you could just go with it, and it's because it doesn't really matter, and you'll enjoy yourself more if you're not stressed out about it. So, if you try to dab it away, you would still have a remnant of a of a dot there. It's very faint because this is yellow. So it's not too dark. The part, the green down here is quite staining the blue green, um, and therefore it's quite hard to get out. But yellow, um, this was still wet and it's quite pale. So you can see up here that the wet on wet has now blended into kind of you've got all sorts of nice shapes in there. Sorry. Yes, that was wet into wet in the water, and that was wet paint into wet paint. And they've both got all these nice textures and shapes in. And that's I really like that in a paint. Um, if you want to go wet onto dry, this was wet paint onto dry paper. So it's got nice crisp edges. Wet paint onto pretty dry paint there, but we're about to find out. Let's see if I can put a nice blue green leaf on top. And because it is dry underneath, get a nice crisp shape on top and also you get the, the effect um, of a colour plus another colour on top darkening it so remember each time it's good to start with really pale colours at the bottom because as you add more and more layers each layer brings more pigment with it and so you end up with the equivalent of um, 15 layers of paint on one space um, so it will be a lot darker so if you start pale then it gives you more options for um, adding more details later on. OK, so we've got wet onto wet, which was wet paint into water or wet paint into wet paint. Got wet on dry, which is wet paint onto dry paper or wet paint onto dry paint. Got the blending of the green into the blue there. Lifting is when you take paper uh, with paint on it and you lift the colour back off. So that was what we did while it was dry. And now let's have a little look at how well it works. Um, so that was how we did it when it was wet. And now let's have a little look at how easy or not it is to get it off once it's dry. So you get a wet brush and you can rub and you can see that starting to come off. You can then give it a dab with the kitchen towel and you can see it's got softer edges. If you've got smaller brushes with stiffer bristles, you can get quite a sharp edge onto it, but it will never be as sharp as um, taking it out while it's still wet. So if I try and get a sharpish edge on here, so you can get quite nice sort of glistening onto water and um, a shine on a, um, a smooth surface and things like that using this, this technique. I've had a little look at all these different leaf shapes um, and how to undo some mistakes. Uh, but undoing mistakes, I strongly recommend if you're going to go with my style of doing things, just give yourself a break. We're going to make loads of mistakes because we're learning 
Um, and it's so much more enjoyable if you don't stress out over these things. I say that as someone who's a recovering perfectionist and um, definitely, definitely understand why that is hard and that you would want something to look perfect. But it's so it's watercolor supposed to be relaxing and it's really good to try and just give yourself a break. So one of the other things that I wanted to have a little look at was how you can get different colors out of your palette because you won't have a million um, different colors when you get started. So it's nice to see how much you can get out of one color block. So to start off with, we'll put one paint up there, nice thick paint. Okay, so you've got a nice bright pinky red. This is quinacridone pink, I believe. So you've got that's a gorgeous colour, okay? Loads of loads and loads of vibrant colour there. And now if you would like um, a pale pink, then you've got all these different shades of pink within this one tube. Okay, this is blending as well. Okay, so as you watch it, it's going to spread down that page and you're going to see how many different shades of pink you're going to get out of this one, um, out of this one tube of colour. You can drop some more water into it and watch it really spread. If we tip the page now, yeah, look, it's going to do it on its own. It's going to burst out into the colour, so this is wet into wet. But on top of that, let's say, show you how this one colour reacts with some other colours. So pink plus yellow is going to give you some really nice peachy oranges. Pink plus a bit of Dusty Luna Blue is going to give you some really nice dusty purple colours. Pink plus a vibrant turquoise blue is going to give you some really, really vibrant purples. Let's go for pink. If we wanted to tone it down a little bit and make it a little bit less hot pink and vibrant, you could add a little bit of green and you'll get a really nice muted pink. Let's take that back right into the pink. At the moment, it just looks like a big clash. But there's a lovely dusty kind of antique pink. That's just a tiny bit of sort of an opposing colour. Um, Pink plus a tiny bit of brown. Same, let's mix it in and you just end up with a really gentle muted colour and you can give yourself a whole colour palette from just taking one colour and adding lots of other colours and seeing what happens. Um, is there anything we're missing there? Let's see. Pink plus. Little bit of orange, not hugely dissimilar from the yellow effect below, but it is slightly different. So there you go. And then each of these can then be watered down like this to get infinite more shades out of them. So you can get some really gentle peaches out of the yellow and um, the yellow and pink mix, just like you can with the orange just by adding some water. And this purple would take you right to the palest of lavenders. You can see it's gonna all bleed into itself and uh, show you lots of different shades in there. This one's turning out to be a really lovely dusty pink. You could make some really nice roses and things out of that. Um, yeah, so don't be scared to just get a full page and have a play with your colors. And take a look at the tutorials online because I've got, lots and lots of tips if you like this style of doing things and these sorts of colors and um, relaxing and just trying to really enjoy it rather than uh, stress yourself out um have a look at my tutorials because they're things like how to do backgrounds how to do a big anti-perfection flower garland how to create um 
mushrooms and we're going to do jellyfish and there's all sorts of different things in there so take a little look and I'm always happy to receive questions so you can message me on Facebook Instagram by my website um I think those are the main ways to get me I've got email and have a look through my blog posts because there's a really good one on materials that will get you started with lots of um, low cost options um, for uh, setting yourself up when you want to learn to do what's colour painting. And there's all sorts of other things in there as well. So get in touch. I'd love to see what you paint and what you think of this introduction to watercolour. Hopefully see you again soon. Thanks for coming. Bye.